Now, let's remember, Cornell West he grew up wealthy and he spent his entire life in Ivory Tower, Harvard, Yale and Princeton. He doesn't he's not a member of the working class. He never was. And uh, I am. I've been blue collar my entire life. I was a bricklayer. I did tuck pointing. And then I became a, a stand up comedian, which is the most blue collar thing you could do, entertaining drunks. Uh, in nightclubs and banging my head and sleeping in condos and banging my head against the blue collar wall for 30 years. Right. He didn't do any of that, which is why he gets to then talk about identity politics ad nauseum. And go ahead. You want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important to uh, this is what I make the point about in the book, too, is that working class people use their bodies to work. That's how they earn their living. That's right. They like drain themselves. Or <laughs> I'm descended of a uh, long generation, long generations of um, peasants. My uncle, I'm in China right now, was a blue collar worker his whole life, retired, a factory worker, never made more than a factory worker's wage. And you know, I worked every bad job. Uh, can I say shitty on your show? Sure. Yeah, I've worked, <laughs> I've worked every shitty job in the world that women are allowed to work. And so, when you have this experience, like of sort of how when you're working these jobs or you're using up your body and your energy and you look at how people look at you, you understand like how low you are in the social totem pole. And the professional manager class are the brain workers. They're the knowledge workers. They're like in the information economy. So many things in the world still need physical labor to be done, like <laughs> longshoremen. We we want to automate everything because basically we don't want to have unruly workers. They could, uh, they would automate bricklaying if they could, Jimmy, so that there wouldn't be a person like you. You know what I mean? They would have robots do that. And then you'd have like unemployed, opioid addicted people who were once working class and who are just unemployed. But these knowledge workers, people who only like use their minds for a living, they really think that being smarter makes them better than everyone else. And I'm just like, no, it does not. And your smarts is a very like um, narrow form of smarts. Like, uh, you know, I I don't know how to solve this problem. I just feel like we have to identify um, it be first. Combative. Yes, I and then so I'm going to be combative with Cornell West right here, okay. and and so this all comes down. By the way, so all this trans issues and gender identity and all that is that is not coming from the grassroots. That is not coming from the bottom up. That is coming from the top down. That is coming from BlackRock. That is coming yes. from Vanguard. That is called DEI and the diversity. Equity, equity inclusion? and inclusion. And what is that? What's that there to do? That's there to put a shield of virtue around the companies that are raping the planet and crushing workers. So they can say, look, look, we've got we've got gay people. We've got trans people crushing workers. It helps pharmaceuticals we've, too. We've, we've got pharmaceuticals. Yeah, we've got uh, a black people and brown people. And we've got women. We've got all these people doing all the horrible things. But they're now getting a good salary for doing it. And doesn't that make us virtuous? So that's and so and Cor Cornel West could not stop using that language, could, could not stop talking about trans issues, could not stop talking about gender, white supremacy, calling his political opponents fascists, which is comes right from BlackRock and Vanguard and the Democratic elite establishment, the billionaire class that runs the whole world. And here I am trying to impress upon him, and I'd like to get your reaction to it. So let me just say this. So the point of running a third party campaign is is uh, to offer an alternative to the two major parties to bring together disaffected members of those parties along with independents and others who feel alienated from the political system as it exists. And, and the best way to do this is by running on economic issues that unite us but which neither major party is willing to address because they're both beholden to the same powerful corporate interests. The Democratic Party long ago abandoned the working class in favor of beating the drum on cultural issues, and now that's all the Democrats have to run on. So if voters are looking for a party running on trans rights and calling Donald Trump and his supporters white supremacists, they can already vote for Democrats. The role of a third party is to focus not on the identity politics that divide us, but on core economic issues that unite us along class lines like Christian Smalls did at Staten Island. Do you think he, he led with LGBTQ trans rights and white supremacy? Or do you think he organized along class lines? That's what we have to do. You have to organize, meet people where they are. That's a, So what is your plan to organize along class lines? Or are you going to keep talking about white supremacy and 
and all those identity politics which are there, not from the ground up, from the top down, to make sure we stay divided? What is your plan to organize along class lines? Well, I appreciate again the clarity and candor of what you have to say. We have profound disagreements, brother. When I when I when I organize around white supremacy, I'm not making some utilitarian calculation. I'm speaking as a black man who comes out of a tradition that's been terrorized and traumatized by white elites. And that it, that does not in any way mean it takes me away from class issue. Class issues are crucial. Trans class issues are fundamental. But it doesn't mean that I'm putting up with white supremacy. One of the problems is that you get too many folk who want to talk class, 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 and can't say my mumbling word about white supremacy, police brutality, uh -oh. can't say a mumbling word hardly, or when they do. So that was basically his response, and mm -hmm. it was super disappointing. And yeah. uh, even yeah. when I tried to point out to him, he didn't care about what happened to people during COVID and lockdowns and how we were how it was a controlled demolition of our economy that benefited a handful of millionaires and billionaires and crushed everybody else. And I tried to point that out to him and because he didn't mm. care about COVID. He didn't care about that. He had, he didn't care that 70,000 workers got fired in one state alone. Healthcare workers got fired in one state alone because they wouldn't go along with a mandate from Big Pharma to enrich them. And here's what he said. Here's why we did it. Black you know, business I, owners I, I, collapsed by 41% black business because of lockdowns. It, do you care yet well, no, 70,000 workers in one state were fired because of vaccine mandates when are you going to care do they all have to be trans how do you when are you going to care about these workers what are you going to care about what are you going to care about this so anyway i would just like to get your response to that it was a very frustrating interview for me because i thought a third this if there was ever a time for a third party candidate to make a headway in this country is now and he's on purpose throwing it away by incorporating the professional managerial class language and lexicon into his campaign which is there to divide people and keep us from coming together along class lines and i'm luckily i'm not as dumb as a harvard professor that i could see through that too bad he's not what do you have to say well, you know what, I think that, you know, what I long for is someone who will speak to, like, universal issues of human dignity and actually crunch the numbers. You know, if there are 25 percent of people who have college degrees and of those 25, like half, like maybe 13 percent are part of the PMC elites, then you have the majority of Americans who don't go to college, who are going to work non-professional jobs and whose lives are really fucked up by not just by by capitalism by this what i would call liberal authoritarianism and the things that they face every day are is economic stress and um white supremacy as a kind of um monolith is part of racism maybe but i think like the the person who's like working 90 hours a week to support their family who's Latina, who's black, who's white, is facing like economic exploitation. And here's the thing that the other thing that I'm really disappointed about, and I'm just going to be super empirical about this. The largest number of poor people in America are white. How do you explain that? Supreme. White supremacy <laughs> like gives white people this get out of jail free card why are the largest numbers of poor people in America white? What's wrong with them? Like, can't they just go and say, like, I'm white, like, uh, give me something? No, because it's class that actually divides us, and it divides us universally. Um, it's economics that exploits us and exploits us universally. And that is something that I guess Cornell West has funders or something that he doesn't want to talk about. Um, what I'm really disappointed by and what I think is, you know, really, you know, the thing about the Dems and the Libs is that they're, they love niche politics. They think the people are going <laughs> to follow them. They think the people are held hostage to them and their little niche politics. And that's why they have to, like, beat the drum about um, the Republicans being, oh, Donald Trump being a fascist. Well, here's what fascism is like the unity of po political, economic and military power. Right. And so I don't know that we're completely there yet. We might be. But what we definitely have is a kind of liberal authoritarianism that brooks no dissent. 
So I'm like scared of saying certain things, but I'm also old and I've also got tenure. I mean, I could be margin. I could be demonized just for coming on your show. I don't really give a shit anymore. But um, <laughs> what happens is like you can't have a disagreement with people today. And that is not liberal. That's authoritarian. Because if you see like I disagree with you on that point um, and you'll come back to me and say you're a bad person and you belong in like PMC jail, like that's actually not liberal. And um, the the we can't even have proper disagreements these days. Everything is um, made. Everything is like um, failed through this like morality play, and somehow repeating certain mantras like white supremacy, white supremacy, white supremacy is supposed to make us feel good about who we are. You know what it is? Capitalism does not discriminate. It exploits you no matter who you are. And speaking of BlackRock, one of the things that happened right before the lockdown was that BlackRock was actually sanctioned by the UN High Commission on Human Rights for buying up social housing in oh. beaten down areas of Sweden, Romania, all over the world, renovating it and then pumping up the rent like three times. The same things they've been doing in the United States that has produced all this homelessness is they're trying it now in other countries in the world. But after 2020 lockdown, we just ignored any of that stuff and we just um, went forward. Like we need to have citizen vigilance about what is happening with private equity, with these giant hedge funds. They have way too much money and politicians have let that happen. So if someone's not talking about that, but it's just talking about white supremacy, then I just don't think we're ever, ever going to get to a more economically just um, society. I couldn't. With their leadership. So as Kurt makes the point on the show, class is not downstream from uh, your gender. It's not downstream from your uh, race or your ethnicity. It supersedes all that. So when the. Not, exactly. And so. The working class gay person, the working class trans person, that person is fundamentally different from Caitlyn Jenner or, you know, um, someone of their identity, of their sexual identity. They are working class. So the other thing about um, the configuration of trans rights is it should be part of universal health care. But, you know, through all the studies that I've looked at, it's. 0.075% of the population, these are longitudinal studies that have been done for years, have gender dysphoria. So this is what I was talking about in terms of allowing us to look at tiny numbers of people, making others follow in these niche politics when 75% of Americans don't have college educations and are not part of the professional managerial class. How can we guarantee a good life for them? We're not. We're leaving them behind. We're like saying, you know what? You didn't get into college. So, you know, your shitty life is your own fault. But the thing is that people need to find a kind of solidarity with each other and oppose this stuff. So in the absence of any left organized um, opposition, like you, you were giving Cornell West the opportunity to be that third party spokesperson in the absence of that kind of third party. I'm speaking for the working class. I care about them. Um figurehead they're going to either not vote or they're going to vote for the clown because he's the disruptor of the system and they're going to be like you know what he's actually uh, out of control and funny and all of these other people are all these other jokers are you know um speaking speaking from a script that i don't recognize i mean it it, it, it he's a criminal he's a criminal but i the law is working against me and i actually think like um you know, I see all of this hand wringing on the liberal side going, oh, my God, how can they vote for him? He's a criminal. It's like if the whole system feels like it's working against you, you're going to be like, you know what? The criminal, maybe he's a person like me. 
Yeah. Uh, mean, by like- the w- by the way, they're all criminals. Uh, every president in my lifetime is a war criminal. OK, they're all criminals. You're going to tell me that so I've had a friend say to me, but Jimmy, Trump actually broke laws. And you and, <laughs> and that's why and that's why Dick Cheney and George Bush still walk the earth <sighs> free men. They lied us into a, a genocidal war that killed a million people. They ordered a torture program to cover it up. And then Barack Obama is constitutionally compelled to prosecute them. And he didn't. And he said, because all those crimes happened in the past and he's not looking at the past torture crimes. He's looking towards the future. That was the public reason he gave. The real reason that Barack Obama didn't prosecute George Bush and Dick Cheney is because he works for the exact same people that Dick Cheney and George Bush worked for, which is the military industrial complex, Wall Street, oil companies, and big pharma. And that, I, the reason I know that is because Barack Obama's entire cabinet came from a single email from Citigroup. Everybody that was in that email that Citigroup wanted in his cabinet ended up in his cabinet. And you know how I know that? Julian Assange revealed that through WikiLeaks, which is why the Republicans and Democrats alike have been trying to kill Julian Assange ever since he revealed the game. And that's what's going on. And that's the part that Brock, uh, that's what uh, Cornell West didn't want to uh, come to terms mm-hmm. with on my show. Mm-hmm.